I think without further ado, we can start. Uh, we can start this webinar then. Natasha, up to you. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Gwen. Welcome everybody. My name is Nedjla Rettberg. I work on Open Air. I'm based at the University of Göttingen and I just wanted to welcome our speakers and welcome all of you uh, for attending this Open Science Policy Creation webinar. We'll be focusing maybe mainly on open science policies, but there will be some chance to ask questions about legal issues in relation to open science policies. So it won't be a webinar about legal issues um, on, on independently. It'll be focusing on open science policies. So for those of you who are new to Open Air, I want to give you a quick uh, run through of what we do. And also, I just want to introduce our speakers today and our experts. We have Marina Angelaki from the National Documentation Centre in Greece, who is driving this effort and this task force on open science policy creation. She has um, a lot of experience in creating guides on open science policies, and she'll be here leading the webinar. And we also have Prodromos Diavos from Greece and Thomas Margoni from the University of Glasgow, who are here um, in the background to ask any legal questions. So you may have many questions during this webinar, just put them in the chat, we will record them and we will do our very best to answer all of them within the hour. So um, a little quickly an introduction to Open Air, I thought I'd take the liberty to, for those of you who are new, to tell you a little bit about it. Um, we are a large infrastructure funded by the European Commission that is supporting open science, specifically scholarly communication outputs and moving it towards um, a more freer way of doing science. So we provide a number of different services and a network of people and many different training efforts such as today to support different people such as researchers and research support staff and librarians, librarians and infrastructure providers. So we believe in gathering many different parts of uh, scholarly communication outputs together and sharing them openly and connecting them and ultimately making them more visible and the more fairer way of doing science. So to explain exactly what that is, we work in three different er areas. We provide services for funders, so that's monitoring open science and their research outcomes. So the out research outcomes arising from grants and from uh, different scientific programs so that we can monitor the outputs. So we've done that for the European Commission and for many different funders across Europe. Um, we also then work on a technical level by providing a technical infrastructure which gathers together many different outputs from repositories, from publishers and content providers and making them interoperable and exchangeable um, and making the outputs more visible. And then ultimately the, with the red uh, arrow this is the support uh, expertise that we offer such as today. We offer an open science help desk and many different training um, and RDM services for research data management and open science. So this is for researchers, but also for institutions and anyone who's attending this webinar. So um, open science works in different ways in, in every different country, of course, and we operate a large uh, network in every single country in Europe and beyond. So we have 34 countries involved. And in each country, we have an ambassador for Open Air who is there on the ground to answer questions about open science and open access. Because open science works in different ways in each different country and the infrastructures are all different and the policies are different. And um, if, if we're linking them to different parts of the world as well, all these infrastructures. So we're mainly based in Europe. And I think some of them may well be in the webinar today. We have a very large help desk. These are all the representatives within Open Air and they work um, to support open science, as I said, on the ground. And if you're new to open air, do look up your representative within your country. You can go to our website and have a look for these people and um, they'll be there and happy to respond to any questions you have about policies or open science or open access in general. And the actual support that we do and that what these open science um, help desks are doing are supporting policies. So we have supported the European Commission working on harmonizing its open science and open access policy and harmonizing that at a local level. So we do a lot of training and support within each different country and creating materials 
In terms of infrastructure, we support uh, content providers and repository managers connecting their repositories to OpenAir and any other open outputs. So that can be publishing out any kind of publishing outputs and software. And of course, we support open research data, the pilot for the Open Commission and beyond. So we support fair data and we create many different tools and offer legal support and compliance with the pilot as well. And last but not least, but very important, open access to publications. The experts are there to give you guidance and to information about licensing and copyright and compliance with any kind of open access mandates that you may have. So on our website, you can take a look at the resources. We have many different guides there in all kinds of areas of difference um, in open science. So not just Horizon 2020, but, other, but beyond about making data fair and repositories. Um, so take a look after this webinar uh, to see what we have. And those guides, all, we're always making new ones and we welcome any suggestions for new guides as well. And we have a help desk and we have a set of FAQs and you can see our body of webinars and workshops there. And we regularly hold webinars such as these, which are recorded on our website on many different topics and they're free for anyone to attend. Um, so keep an eye out for any new ones coming up. And the, um, just a last slide on the capacity, we're building these task forces within our consortium on legal policy and RDM issues. And this webinar is coming out of the policy arm of this and I also welcome, as well as our expert speakers, we also, have, well, I haven't mentioned the other speakers who Marina will also introduce who have contributed hugely to these policy guides um, and also to the legal task force. So that's a very quick overview of what I do. Thank you for giving me the chance. I'm going to hand you over now to Marina, who will share her screen, who will walk you through many different areas of creating open science policies and some concrete examples and some other speakers as well will be show, showcasing their policies. Um, thank you, Najla, and welcome everybody. I will just uh, um, share my screen. Is that okay? Yes, that yes, is. Just oh, no, go hang to on. the presenting mode, please, Marina. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I will start with a short introduction about the, the structure of the, um, of the presentation. Um, first of all, um, this webinar gives us the opportunity to present and disseminate to a wider audience the work that we have done over the past year and a half in terms of supporting stakeholders uh, wishing to adopt or update their open access policies, so taking into consideration developments that have taken place uh, primarily at um, EU level, but also at the national context. And uh, we will do so by presenting the, the materials we have uh, developed in, uh, in open air, such as the, the toolkit for policymakers and the, the templates for open science policies uh, for research funding and research performing uh, organizations along with the checklist, and also highlighting the elements that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, secondly, uh, we will present uh, examples of policies that have been adopted over the past year or so by our project uh, members. Um, the idea behind this is to um, inspire uh, participants, uh, but also stress the extent at which uh, um, those key elements that we will discuss have been uh, taken into uh, consideration, the elements that have been identified by uh, um, the open air team uh, as, uh, as important. Um, so here we uh, we had the, the the support and the help of our um, of our uh, nodes, um, the uh, the network of um, open uh, access uh, desks. Uh, we will present examples from uh, from 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 Turkey. Uh, then Milica Sevkusic, uh, the the NOAD from Serbia, will uh, present the um, uh, Serbian open science policy that has been recently adopted. And also, we will have a presentation from Eli Dijk from uh, the the, Nether the Netherlands, um, also presenting um, the. Um, 
the Open Science uh, platform. Uh, finally, we will also have the um, opportunity uh, with the help of our um, legal experts, uh, Prodromos and, and Thomas, to discuss some uh, legal aspects um, that are related to uh, the adoption of um, um, Open Science policies. Uh, so as Najla uh, mentioned, um, Open Air is, uh, is a project uh, that uh, places particular focus on the, uh, on the infrastructure side. Um, nonetheless, we feel that uh, infrastructure and policies are uh, mutually reinforcing uh, elements. And therefore, we have uh, placed particular focus on supporting the, the design and the implementation of uh, open uh, science policies throughout Europe. Um, as a result of this, uh, um, decision. Um, Open Air has created a dedicated task force on, uh, on policies. Um, recently, this uh, task force has been merged with the one focusing on, on legal issues. Initially, we had two distinct um, task forces, one focusing on policy issues and one on, 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 legal, uh, on legal issues. Uh, but as we identified uh, common aims, we decided to, um, to merge these um, task forces. Um, in relation to the uh, policy aspect, the, the task force has produced a toolkit for policymakers that describes the work that we've done over the past uh, um, uh, year and a half, uh, stressing also the role of the uh, network of national open access desks in this, uh, in this process. Uh, for open air, um, NOADs are expected to have a key role in the promotion of, of policies in their countries. So, so for all of you um, attending this uh, uh, webinar, um, we would like to highlight that for, um, it's not just ask the, the members of the policy uh, and legal task force, but also um, the NOADs that have uh, any depth uh, knowledge and understanding of open science policies, and um, uh, they can also provide um, support. Um, and um, um, so uh, more importantly, this uh, toolkit comprises uh, the policy templates for uh, research performing organizations and research uh, funding uh, um, organizations. Uh, during this first year, uh, we decided to focus our work on the on the templates and, and, and checklist. Um, this is something that was pointed out by the NOADs of uh, Region South and Region East, as uh, in both cases, um, they were in the process of, um, uh, of developing policies and uh, they had uh, requested further support uh, in, in this effort. Um, by contrast, NOADs, uh, NOADs in Region West were more interested in issues around the monitoring of policies, and this is something that we will um, uh, focus on our work um, later on. Um, the exchange of experiences and, and best practices is also um, an issue that has been highlighted by our NOAD uh, network as important, and thus we feel that uh, this uh, webinar is an, uh, is an attempt uh, um, to uh, contribute towards um, uh, reaching uh, this goal. <coughs> Um, the, um, the templates for research performing and research funding uh, organizations are um, uh, available uh, on Zenodo as distinct uh, items. Um, these are meant to act as, uh, as guides for, um, for your work um, in terms of um, uh, adopting and uh, developing open science policies. Um, obviously, as it was mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction to this uh, webinar, there is no one size uh, fits all um, approach in terms of the uh, of um, open science policies. Um, these um, obviously need to take into consideration uh, factors uh, like the uh, existence of national infrastructure, also cultural uh, aspects. And then we also need to take into consideration that we have policies of various types, uh, ranging from um, hard ones, mandating um, um, different things or softer ones. Obviously, um, the language used is uh, um, important and policy can either mandate or simply call or encourage um, um, different stakeholders uh, to do different things. 
And also it is important to uh, understand um, the, uh, the body adopting um, the policy, uh, whether we are talking about the rector or, or, or the library. So it is important to also know um, um, who um, is uh, is adopting this policy? Um, nonetheless, and despite this um, um, these differences in terms of the the types of uh, policies, we have identified a number of uh, elements that are um, important in in developing um, an open science and, and an open access policy. Um, in, in the sense that um, um, they have an impact uh, on the the policies. Uh, effectiveness. Um, for example, um, it is important for the policy uh, to clearly define the rights, uh, the roles and the responsibility uh, of each party uh, involved or to put it more simply um, to state who does what. It's not just uh, the obligations of a researcher, for example. Um, other um, uh, units, for example, within a university or departments uh, may be involved in this um, um, uh, in this process, so it is important for the, the policy um, to clearly state who is doing uh, what. Um, also, elements um, related to what needs to be um, uh, deposited, for example, what types of publications or uh, research data, uh, where, uh, when, um, in terms of data, whether there is um, um, uh, the opt-out option and under uh, what circumstances and whether the uh, researcher is required to, uh, um, um, to develop a data management planned and and the extent at which there is support by um, uh, the library or any other unit uh, within the university um, it's also important for the policy to provide um, information uh, about uh, a potential review or the policy and uh, also if there is information regarding a uh, uh, mechanism for for monitoring and, and compliance uh, sometimes this is also linked to uh, um, the assessment and evaluation uh, procedures within uh, um, an organization um, training and awareness is also um, an important aspect and here again it uh, um, a policy becomes more effective uh, when it um, when it has uh, information about um, who provides um, this uh, this training, how often, to who um, who the training um, is, is is targeting. For example, whether this is just for researchers or also for uh, librarians or um, other stakeholders um, um, in an institution. Um, we have also developed a um, checklist, uh, both for research performing and research funding uh, organizations. Um, this is um, 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 a guide um, allowing institutions to uh, assess the readiness in adopting an open science policy. Um, again, it covers the main elements that should be taken into account when designing uh, a policy and here there is an attempt to align uh, um, uh, these elements with the horizon requirements um, and other developments at EU level. Uh, the checklist is basically structured uh, around 14 statements and for each one of them there are uh, three possible answers. Um, it's not a question of uh, right and wrong, it's rather um, um, a way of, of showing the, the degree of readiness. Uh, so in that sense, um, um, if you have, um, if uh, you choose more um, uh, the, the, the first um, response, then this indicates a, a higher degree um, of readiness. Uh, once again, this has nothing to do with um, uh, being right or wrong. Um, just as an example, for uh, in terms of the rewards and incentives, um, an institution um, is more ready when, for example, uh, open science is integrated as a formal criter criterion in research assessment and evaluation uh, procedures. 
this element is more weak uh, if the policy simply um, encourages its members to adopt open science practices, but these uh, are not uh, embedded as a, as a criterion during research and assessment evaluation procedures. And the policy becomes even weaker if there is um, no mechanism of, to incentivize or reward researchers um, engaged in uh, open access uh, practices. Again, uh, when it comes to training, uh, a policy uh, becomes more effective when um, um, it provides uh, um, um, uh, training on a, on a regular basis, not just for researchers, but also uh, for um, other members, such as, for example, uh, librarians. And uh, when the policy also takes into consideration that this training should uh, uh, um, be tailored to uh, um, disciplinary differences or to researchers at different stages uh, of their careers. Um, the policy becomes then uh, um, uh, weaker if um, courses are, for example, provided but not on a regular basis or these are of limited scope. Um, a policy is even weaker when there's uh, a simply guidance by um, an institution on training courses offered by um, um, other projects or initiatives such as Open Air or Foster or RDA. Uh, but it's not provided by the, um, the institution um, per se. Um, so I think that we will have the opportunity to um, um, discuss this elements further through uh, more uh, practical um, examples. Um, the first one is the, the case of, um, of Turkey and, the, and Tubitak, uh, which is the, the main funder, uh, research uh, funder in, in, in Turkey, um, who has uh, recently um, adopted uh, an open science policy that includes both uh, publications and, and, and research data. Um, this is um, um, an important uh, um, um, initiative as the, the number of researchers affected by this policy um, is approximately 25,000. So you can understand the, the impact of, uh, um, of the adoption of, um, of such a policy. Uh, before its actual uh, adoption, Tubitag uh, conducted uh, a couple of surveys on research data management and open access awareness and, and satisfaction and has also held trainings on the, the management of research data to raise uh, further awareness about open science and uh, research uh, data management. Um, these two initiatives, both the surveys and the trainings, are, are, are important elements in the, in the process as they, uh, especially for countries where researchers are not that familiar with uh, open science, as it um, um, helps to raise further uh, awareness about uh, open science and what a policy um, might actually um, involve. Um, so during also the, the preparation uh, um, uh, process and before the, um, the adoption, the, um, the Turkish NOAD had um, a key role in the process as um, they translated the, the templates uh, into uh, Turkish and uh, um, had um, uh, several uh, uh, consultations with um, um, Tubitak personnel on the on the model for uh, um, the open science policy um, to be adopted. Um, so this is also something um, that has uh, further helped the, the process of um, adopting um, the policy. Um, on your left hand side, you can see the members of the Tubitak Open Science uh, Committee, and there you can uh, um, also see at the bottom um, Guldekin Gordal who is uh, the, the NOAD from the open air NOAD from, from Turkey. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the policy covers both uh, publication and, and research data that have been produced uh, by, by researchers who received a full or partial funding by, uh, by, by Tubitak. Um, the funder requires um, 
researchers to deposit in Tubitac uh, repository a copy of the accepted version of their peer-reviewed articles, uh, who are completely or partially funded uh, by, by Tubitac. Um, the green road uh, um, is, uh, is being proposed uh, and uh, for gold open access this is um, uh, recommended. Um, Tubitac requires um, that the researchers open the full text of their publication as soon uh, um, as it is accepted or no later than six months for publications in life sciences, technology, engineering and mathematics and no later than 12 months uh, for publications in uh, social sciences and humanities, something which is aligned with um, um, the horizon uh, framework. Um, the funder also recommends um, um, the creation of a research uh, data management uh, uh, plan. And um, again, there is, uh, in terms of research uh, data, there is the possibility uh, of opt-out. Um, um, so therefore, we can say that the approach of Tubitac um, is, is uh, very much aligned with the, the Commission's uh, motto as open as possible, as closed as uh, necessary. Um, Tubitac will also prepare uh, um, templates and, and guides for uh, the development of um, data management plans. Um, obviously, if, if these were already uh, available by the time of um, the adoption of the policy, um, this um, would have been uh, better. Nevertheless, it is good that it is mentioned that um, this will be the, the responsibility um, um, of the funder. It is also important that there is a link with the um, evaluation as um, the funder will take into account uh, what the researcher, whether the researcher has uh, complied with this uh, policy uh, um, when uh, requesting further, um, further support, uh, when the researcher will um, um, request further uh, funding. And um, um, there is also um, a monitoring and a review procedure. And in terms of uh, the open science policy, um, Tubitac encourages uh, the cooperation with um, other stakeholders to promote open science. Given the fact that Tubitac has a central um, a role as a, as a funder in the, in the country, um, it is, um, I think, quite obvious that um, it is an important step in, uh, in, in, in promoting uh, um, open science policy uh, um, in, uh, in, in, in Turkey. Um, I think that the, 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 the only, let's say, um, weak point could be related to the fact that, that uh, maybe further emphasis could have been uh, placed on uh, raising further awareness and, uh, um, and, 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 and training uh, following the adoption of the, of the policy. Um, nonetheless, uh, this is something, um, obviously, that since um, um, the NOAD is in close contact with Tubitak, that could be further discussed and where the, the NOAD from Turkey could also uh, have a, a central uh, role in terms of uh, um, raising awareness and uh, um, supporting any training uh, um, activities um, targeting uh, researchers who have uh, received uh, funding from, from, from Tubitec. Um, um, so. The um, um, Izmir Institute of Technology, where the uh, NOAT from Turkey um, is based, has also uh, um, uh, approved uh, its uh, open science policy um, um, a couple of months uh, ago. This is the first open science policy uh, in Turkey, um, including um, covering both uh, publication and, and research uh, data. And it is expected to, to, to act as a best practice uh, example for, for other universities in, in Turkey wishing um, to uh, revise or um, adopt open science uh, um, policies. Um, so I think that now we can uh, move on to the um, um, example of, of Serbia and the uh, open science platform with the help of uh, um, our colleague Milica. Hey, I can use your slides and uh, I will ask you to uh, change slides because I can't do this with your presentation. Is it okay? Yes. 
Okay, so in, uh, please go to the second slide. Uh, the Open Science Platform in Serbia is uh, basically a founder platform, but uh, having in mind the status of the founder, the, the main national founder, it is actually a national platform that applies to, to, to all research conducted in uh, Serbia. Uh, there was a lot of work uh, regarding this policy and it took uh, many, many years of activities by uh, our node in Serbia, Biljana Kosanovic. I'm actually just supporting the process, but Biljana was the main person in this, who initiated this. Many negotiations and uh, this process started sometime in 2012. Uh, there were a number of working groups, informal, informal working groups, until 2017, when an official working group uh, was established. Uh, and this group included uh, members of the ministry responsible for science, representatives of universities, representatives of the National Council for Science, and librarians. So we wanted to, uh, to uh, obtain as wide consensus as possible before adopting the policy and to involve all the, all the stakeholders in the process in order to make this uh, policy as feasible as possible. So those discussions were uh, very, very, uh, there were some high quality inputs in those discussions and they uh, actually shaped the policy. The initial draft used for the policy was uh, the, the toolkit produced uh, uh, during the Pasteur for Open Access pro uh, project. And uh, I can say that uh, this type of uh, approach, uh, using toolkits with all the explanations, with checklists, is very useful when devising the policy because uh, everything is already there and uh, what the working group or, uh, or the stakeholders doing, making the policy should do is just to adjust what is provided in the toolkit to their local context. And our local context was quite, quite uh, uh, complicated at the moment when the policy was devised. Uh, just to say that uh, the last project cycle uh, started in, two, in 2011, has been extended on multiple occasions, and it actually should have been finished some four or five years ago. Uh, and that is because our uh, funding system, the system for funding science in Serbia is being changed. So uh, new legislation is being devised. Uh, many discussions are still ongoing and this uh, also affected the process of adopting the policy. So that is why some things could not be uh, determined in the policy but were left for some laws and bylaws and some other occasions to, to be discussed. Uh, because we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't know crucial information at the moment when the policy uh, was devised. Uh, also, uh, those new laws, for example, the most important is the new uh, draft law on science, uh, and we expect the new law to be, to be ad adopted within a month or two. Uh, it explicitly mentions open science, and it actually uh, covers, in a number of articles, it covers the issues related to open science, even funding. Also in the action plan uh, that will be valid until uh, 2020, open science is mentioned. Uh, open science is also mentioned in uh, university policies and strategies. So this is the process I'm just talking about. The main obstacle in the process, uh, along with those, uh, with the situation, is underdeveloped repository infrastructure. Uh, until last year, uh, we had we didn't have more than five repositories in Serbia, functional repositories. And over the last year, we managed to establish a dozen. So the the, the, the infrastructure uh, the infrastructure is being developed now. So some, some of the issues couldn't be covered in the, in the policy because uh, we didn't know the answers related to the infrastructure. Uh, and uh, as I said, we may expect that some of the, of the issues will be mentioned uh, later in some other documents and will be covered and you will see later, I put it all in a table. So Marina, please next slide. Okay, so you can read our policy, the English version, at the first link, and we also registered the policy with the roadmap, so you can see it there as well. This is actually an umbrella policy. 
and it all provides a framework for institutional policy. So institutions are expected to determine some of, of the important issues in their local institutional policies. And one of such issues is, for example, training and responsibilities uh, for depositing, for checking the deposits and such things. And they are already covered. There are a dozen institutional policies in the moment, and those issues are covered in institutional politi policies. Uh, the, uh, the, the policy, the national policy covers both publications and research data, but the, the mandates are different. Uh, we have hired open access mandate for publications, green open access mandate, and uh, open access to research data is merely recommended. So it's not mandated yet, but we expect this to come with, uh, with further legislation once we know the type of funding and all the details related to the new project cycle. We also try to put open peer review in the policy, and this was discussed. Uh, during the meetings of the working group, and this is something that actually has to do with some cultural context, and this was not accepted, so we didn't uh, we didn't put it there. We meant to include a clause saying that open peer review is uh, encouraged, but it couldn't pass, so it it didn't uh, it didn't appear in the final uh, version of the policy, and uh, the policy is very short; it is one and a half pages. But uh, the, it has two annexes uh, specifying some very important issues related to the development of infrastructure. For example, it was very important for us to specify technical standards uh, for repositories uh, and interoperability standards, and they are completely in line with all the open air recommendations, licenses as well. And also we have an annex, although uh, the uh, open access to research data is not mandated, but only recommended, there is an annex dealing with research data that embodies all fair principles, persistent identifiers, so that in case somebody, uh, an institution decides to introduce a mandate for research data so that they have enough uh, recommendations and materials to know how to do this correctly. So, Marina, please, next slide. No, next. So, this is a table, and I try to make it as straightforward as possible, so I think it's self-explaining. So, uh, to the left, in the left column, we have the topics from uh, the open air, recommendation, uh, open air model policy, toolkit. Uh, in the middle column, we have uh, the topics discussed in Serbian, uh, in Serbian Open Science Platform, and in the right column, we have comments uh, explaining why something was defined the way it was defined and uh, what we expect to be defined in some other documents. So basically, uh, at the moment when the uh, policy was devised, we couldn't uh, define uh, for example, the issue of cost related to, to open access uh, to open science activities, but now uh, this issue is defined in the draft on, on the, uh, the draft law on science, where uh, open science activity costs for open science activities are actually recognized as eligible costs and something that will be covered by the national funder. Uh, also, the incentives. Um, uh, are not foreseen in the national policy, but this is something that will be defined in funding contracts and such 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 things in Serbia are usually defined this type of documents. Uh, the, uh, the open access mandate for publications is, is hard. Uh, the embargo periods are somewhat longer than in Europe, uh, 12 months for, uh, so, uh, for uh, science and technology and 18 months for uh, social sciences and humanities, but there is a well, we ha we're having a bit an unusual situation because in most cases we don't have uh, embargo periods uh, in practice. We don't have embargo periods for social sciences and humanities because most researchers publish in local journals. So in most cases, when we have uh, deposits related to those areas, we have zero embargo period. Those, uh, those items are immediately uh, available in our repositories. Uh, hybrid open access is not considered in, ineligible, uh, so uh, it is allowed. But uh, the issue of funding hybrid and gold open access are not uh, not defined. Uh, these costs are mentioned as eligible, but it's not it is not specified who is to cover these costs, and we expect this to to be discussed in uh, in other documents, uh, and especially in funding. 
contracts. And what is interesting, machine readable uh, Creative Commons licenses are mandatory, both for publications and data, and this is specified in the policy. Uh, the, the next slide, please. So, uh, as far as uh, open, uh, open access to research data is concerned, as I mentioned, fair principles are explicitly mentioned and uh, Creative Commons licenses as well. And uh, uh, it, they're even a little bit more specified. It is recommended to introduce research data management plans. Uh, and, uh, but the data-related costs are, again, not mentioned. Uh, also, as for... Um, uh, for some other things as funding acknowledgement, for example, these things are not mentioned because in the policy because they are already regulated and this is something that is normally defined in fu funding contracts so researchers know that they have to uh, acknowledge uh, the funding. And uh, it is said in the policy that the implementation will be monitored and the monitoring results will be used in the evaluation of projects, uh, but this is, it is not specified. Uh, how, and this will certainly be defined in, in other documents later on where we know more about the new project cycle, and the reporting methods are not defined, and also no sanctions uh, are foreseen for non-compliance. And uh, also policy review is not mentioned. Uh, at this moment, when we don't know anything about the new project cycle, this was difficult to be foreseen, but certainly once the new project cycle uh, begins and we know uh, you know more details about the compliance with the policy this will certainly be defined uh, at a later stage so that's practically all I also uh, want to mention that uh, our, our open science policy um, it has a hard mandate not only for journal articles but also for all types of outputs monographs uh, PhD thesis actually we have a already have a PhD mandate, which is very, very efficient. Uh, and uh, for all types of research outputs, all types of publications, conference proceedings, all of them have to be deposited in, in repositories. So that's basically all. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Milica. Um, I think I will stop sharing my screen and give the floor to uh, Ellie. Yes, I will share my screen now. Uh, yep. That's my presentation. Minutes. There it is. You see it? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Ellie Dijk. I work at the Institute Dance Data Archiving and Network Services, and I'm a member of the national platform Open Science in the Netherlands. And I was asked to tell more about the Dutch National Plan Open Science with a focus on promoting open science and citizen science. The Netherlands have a long history in open science. Like elsewhere, it started with open access to publications. Since 2003, all the universities have a repository with open access publications. And later, other research institutes followed. The national portal Narsus, a service of dance, harvests around 35 repositories with publications and 10 uh, repositories with research data. The percentage of open access publication is growing every year, but not quick enough according to the Ministry of Science and Academic Institutes in the Netherlands. There should be, moreover, there should be a transition to open science. So more than just open access to publications. In 2017, a national platform, OpenSign, has been set up and this coalition published a national plan, OpenSign. The goal was to boost the transition towards an open science system. 
In this publication, the platform formulated the following ambitions. Full open access to publications in 2020. To make research optimal suited for reuse. Recognition and rewards for researchers. To promote and support open science. And later, citizen science was added. For each ambition, um, there was a coalition of a number of participants uh, that will make the plans uh, to reach the goals and the sub goals. Here you can see the members of the national platform. It's a broad coalition with the ministry, with uh, the associations of universities uh, and the universities of applied sciences, uh, the academy, the National Research Funder, NWO, uh, my institute, DANS, uh, National Library, etc. This slide shows the transition to open science with skills, rewards and monitoring as cross pillars and advocating open science is necessary to make the transition possible. All the cross pillars are part of the themes of the national plan. Let us have a closer look at the ambitions of the national plan and in my next slides I will focus on the last three. The data infrastructure in the Netherlands is fragmented and there are omissions, so we need to develop an agreed vision on the data services infrastructure. To reach open science, it's necessary that the researchers will also be rewarded, you heard it before, for publishing open access output and for making it possible that the data can be reused. On the website of openscience.nl, you can find a report with recommendations. The next three ambitions I'll discuss in more detail in the next slides. Ali, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but could you make your slides full screen? I have them full screen. Now we see them as presenting mode. Doesn't really bother me, but... Um, I don't know how to do it because... Okay. <laughs> um, maybe no, then if... Just, then just proceed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because okay. I see them full screen. Maybe if I oh wait, I will wait a minute. If I take this out, uh, see if it will be better. No. Okay, then I will proceed. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe I stop share and share another. Maybe I didn't share the right screen. Shall I do that? No, you I can call. Try, don't keep too long. Yeah, that's I, I call. I call. I call. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, do you now see the black thing in it or not? I see it. No. No, something goes wrong now. Um, you don't see a, something black in it, or do you? Yes, yes, yes. We see you in presenting in presenting mode, but it's okay, Ali. Just continue. Sorry. Okay. Just to get you off track. <laughs> <laughs> <Some questions>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, to reach the ambition of open access to publications in 2020, a number of action have, has been taken. An important one is the nego negotiation with publishers, like in many countries, for example, in Norway, uh, to make it possible that researchers can publish their articles as open access. Results of the negotiations were where researchers can see how they can publish open access per publisher can be found on our national website openaccess.nl. Another point here is that it's necessary to measure how many open access publications have been published every year by collecting open access number at the universities. I will come to that later. 
And the last point is raising awareness about the possibilities of open access publishing. For example, an open access newsletter by the Association of Universities. And of course, information at the open access website. For monitoring open access publications, definitions were formulated and each university collected numbers of open access publications in the categories called hybrid and green. We can see the number of open access publications, in this case only the journal articles. It's rising from 42% to 50% in 2017. We don't have the numbers of 2018 yet. As an example, I show you the numbers of uh, the Technical University of Delft and you can see that's also the percentage and you can see here also the percentages open access publications in 2018 and it's higher than the years before. We expect this growth at all the universities. One of the themes of the national platform is to promote and support open science. So the website open science has been, uh, but dot and L has been developed. And we decided that on this website, there would be information about the national plan open sign and that we link the existing websites like the open access uh, website, uh, where there is a lot of, lot more uh, information. Platform also organized a national meeting for researchers on the open science in May 2017 and the plan is to uh, organize a second meeting at the end of this year or next year. On the website you can also find the registry of open science speakers so, researcher, so research organizations can invite speakers at their conferences and at their meetings. Dutch universities make great effort to inform their academic staff about uh, open science with web pages, special new letters and, and the like. In or around the International Open Access Week, all kinds of activities are being organized. Citizen science is the theme in the national plan that was added later. What is citizen science? Citizen science is scientific research conducted by amateur scientists. Citizen science has evolved over the past four decades. Technology and internet can be seen as one of the main drivers of the recent ex explosions of citizen science activities. Examples are the digitization of archives or to collect data on particular matters like butterfly or bird counts. It's important that the same principles and standards apply to the citizen, citizen science as to the scientific research in, the, in general. On the other hand, it's also important that researchers and innovation can be more closely aligned with the needs, wishes and interests of society. Citizen science can play a role in it because then more citizens are involved in science. We see that citizen science is involved in the four other themes of the national plan. This was described in one of the notes with recommendations of the coalition involved in citizen science. If you look at the goal of reaching 100% open access to publication, one of the recommendations is that it's important for a growing, for a growing number of non-professional readers that it will be easier to read a scientific publication, for example, by adding layman's summary. For the use of research data, it was recommended that the benefits of, of citizen science should be promoted and that the different disciplines should draw up guidelines and methods for collecting data by citizen science based on commitments and quality. And all with the rule open if possible and protected where necessary. If we want research to make, citizens, to make use of citizen science, then it's also necessary to recognize and explicitly appreciate the efforts of researchers to do so and to have special ear earmarked budget available for citizen science, for example, to support networks. 
And for the team supporting open science, the recommendation is to develop separate guidelines for researchers regarding to deal with non-professional employees by disciplines. Last year, as a platform open science, we worked intensively on the five teams described in a national plan. To give an extra boost to the plans, the steering group of the national platform decided this month that the national platform open science will be transformed into a program open science with different projects and with a timeline to 2023. The leaders of the teams have formulated plans for the next steps. Cost of the transition will also be considered, which extra finances are necessary. Here you can see the different topics of the program. These topics are based on the work that has been done so far. Citizen science is still one of the topics and the coalition will try to realize a national support structure. With regard to open science advocating, the platform has the intention to strengthen the cooperation in the area of encouraging and supporting researchers. So that was my final slide. Thank you, Ellie. Um, Najla, would you um, would you like to say something? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Thanks very much for all our speakers and for keeping on time. It was very useful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I see people are writing questions, but there's mm -hmm. only one question in the. Q&A box from Jonathan. And we also have a couple of more questions that were submitting while mm -hmm. they registered. So, uh, so I don't know how long. I mean, we were scheduled for one hour. I mean, we can go on for, say, 15 more, 10 mm -hmm. to 15 more minutes, if that's okay with everyone, to get through the questions. And also remember, we have uh, Prodromos, a legal expert, to answer questions about open, policy, open science policies and legal issues. So... I guess type the questions and Marina, do you want to maybe start reading the questions? And oh, okay. The, the first one is from Jonathan England. I think it is addressed to Militza. Uh, when discussing the topics among the members of the working group, how did you make a decision? Was it full consensus, majority vote, just informal agreement, etc.? In our case, it was full consensus for most issues. So we covered only the issues that, where we had a full consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not so difficult to achieve. There were some questions where there was, there was no consensus, for example, like open peer review. And also there was another issue that I didn't mention because it's not important to this, in this context. For example, we planned to, uh, uh, to discourage uh, printing. Um, so much money in Serbia is spent on printing, uh, printing journals, printing monographs. More than 50% of, of the budget for publishing is spent on, on printing. So we, we try to discourage this in the policy and this was not accepted by quite many members of the working group. So we decided not to include, not to include it there. So, but it was full consensus for most issues. So is, is there anything else that you that you wish, wish to know? Um, there is another question from Emma. Uh, when an organization decides to develop an open science policy, it should set up a specific working group, as in the Serbian case. What kind of expertise is needed? Um, thank you. Uh, we had different kinds of expertise. For example, Biljana and I, we were involved already very much in open science and uh, the policy development in issues related to education on open science and open, open access. Uh, that was uh, one kind of expertise. So we knew which, uh, which recommendations to take into account, which toolkits, which topics to cover. Uh, but we also included people who are... Uh, um, policy makers and decision makers within institutions, for example, at universities. We had a, a vice director in our working group. We had a head of the National uh, Science, Con Science Council. Uh, we had uh, a, rector, a, a, a rector, a vice rector of the University of Arts. So, uh, and we had decision makers from the ministry. Uh, we tried to uh, include people who were already knowledgeable 
about open science. There was no use of including people who didn't know anything about this. So we tried to find such representatives in various, among various stakeholders that knew enough about open science and were able to discuss the, the topic and who were ready to, to work because actually the working group worked. We discussed two or three drafts. Um, just to add, I think that um, obviously it's not necessary to, to, to set up a, a working group, but no. the idea behind is uh, before the actual adoption of a policy um, to, to involve the, as uh, yeah. many people and different stakeholders um, as possible who, who will have a key role um, in the uh, um, implementation of the, of the policy and who have um, the, the, the expertise to, uh, um, um, to bring into the design of the policy, such as, for example, um, the, the legal um, department of, the, um, of a university who, who will have obviously the expertise in dealing with any legal issues that may arise or also uh, people from the library who um, can have a key role um, in terms of providing um, the training or, or um, um, supporting the, the, the infrastructure. And obviously, um, it's always good to, to involve the, the researchers as they are the ones who are um, um, affected by, by the policy. So it's always good to bring them in the, the discussion and, 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 and hear their, uh, what they have um, to say. And obviously, take into consideration any um, disciplinary differences um, that may exist and may have an impact on the design of the um, of the policy because obviously it's a bit different if you're um, um, a, a university focusing on a specific discipline or if you're in an institution or um, um, a, a big university covering um, different um, uh, disciplines. And it's easier, it's easier to uh, devise institutional policies once we have people from various branches uh, in, involved in devising the national policy. So uh, once uh, it was adopted, the process of ex adopting it locally at institutions was quite satisfactory because the, the, the context was ready for adopting it locally. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the um, um, types of rewards and incentives that have um, the largest impact, I suppose, when it's linked to uh, um, um, evaluation and, and promotion, um, um, uh, promotion, this is um, um, the, the strongest uh, link that can, um, uh, that can exist and can have uh, um, um, an impact. Um, um, so, uh, if I may move to some of the questions that were uh, submitting, uh, submitted during registration, there was one uh, about the uh, um, support that the library um, uh, can provide towards uh, researchers. Um, I, I think this um, this support can have um, can be of various types, such as uh, providing um, training um, about. Um, um, open access and, uh, and open science, um, something that can be done in, uh, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with other organizations outside, uh, let's say, um, um, the university. Um, support in, um, um, in, the, in the development of uh, data management plans, uh, also information um, about appropriate um, repositories or um, open, access, um, open access journals. Um, these are um, different types of, um, of support that the library uh, um, can provide towards, um, towards researchers. And there was also a question uh, about the, um, um, the uh, types of, um, um, of policies for, for, for Greek uh, universities. Um, in Greece, there was um, um, recently the, the, the Directors uh, Summit adopted um, um, 
a decision calling uh, um, all universities um, to adopt uh, open access policies within uh, um, 2019. And um, they recommend a, a hard policy in the sense that they want this policy to uh, mandate um, uh, faculty uh, members um, um, in relation to open access to publications and, and primarily it's open access to publications. Um, the, um, 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 the, the, de the decision has a, a number of, um, um, of, of points uh, that are um, aimed at uh, guiding the institutions. Obviously, they're, they're quite uh, vague. Um, but um, I think that open air through the, the work we've done in terms of the, the templates and through our um, Greek node, we can, uh, we can support you further in, uh, um, in developing um, your, um, your policy. And uh, um, there was also another question. I think it's more um, for our uh, legal experts. Uh, how to adapt data policy to apply GDPR to non-sensitive scientific data. Uh, for example, do authors have a right for their names in DOIs for non-sensitive data sets to be removed? Uh, this could make the data set anonymous and therefore incomplete. I think that maybe um, Prodromos or Thomas are more appropriate to answer this. Prodromos, are you there? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. I'm just uh, trying um, uh, to think how, what, what specific focus would you like us to, to address um, in terms of how you, we actually do the production of the policies? I mean, which aspect in particular, uh, Marina? Um, no, it was just, um, I was just ringing the, a question that was submitted during uh, registration. So uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's not very, very, very clear. So... Uh, um. Uh, because I'm not sure what is the, the clear part of the, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me what the question is. Yeah, should I read it again or put yes, it in? Yes, yes, please. A, a, or, or where is it? On the, I, I'll put it on the... On the uh, is it the, the, uh, the latest one in the uh, Q&A or you put it? Uh, it's, um, it was submitted during registration, so... Uh, if you can read the question, just to make sure I have the right one. Okay, how to adapt data policy to apply GDPR to non-sensitive scientific data? Uh, for example, do authors have a right for their names in DOIs for non-sensitive data sets to be removed? This could make the data set anonymous and therefore incomplete. Yeah, that's a question we have dealt we, we have dealt with um, in quite a few instances actually um, uh, specifically about this question, not uh, with specific reference to the DOI, but in relation to the referencing the use of names of authors in catalogs. We even had in, at the National Documentation Center, by the way. Um, so we have an opinion by even before GDPR, which still applies today, and we know the following thing. Uh, we need to have a legal basis on which we uh, actually perform the processing of the personal data. So the, the big question is how do you actually have you obtained these names? Uh, are these names part of your publicly available data sets? Is this something that you acquire from the authors when they uh, submit something to a repository? Um, so this is the, the biggest question. Um, the legal basis which we normally use are two. Uh, uh, in the context of research data. Uh, in the UK and other jurisdictions, we see um, the um, uh, public interest uh, justification or the um, justification of the exception, the research exception being used. Uh, but again, this has to be um, um, appropriately, appropriately balanced against any kind of measures that have been taken in order to ensure there is no um, unnecessary processing of the relevant data. In other words, we need to, again to go back and ask the same question I asked at the beginning. How did you obtain this data? Now, another option is when you actually obtain this data uh, to make sure that in the consent form, you don't just have copyright provisions, but also some provisions in relation 
to consenting about how the title and the personal data on the title are going to be used. Um, normally, if you have, uh, and the third option is to actually have a notice where you explain how it is going to be used and consider that as being within the framework of the research exception and therefore for you to be able to use it. So um, overall, you have the, th the following options. Either you consent the authors when you obtain the data, if you obtain the data from them, or if you have obtained the data from a public source, you indicate that in the provenance of the data and you have a, a mechanism so that someone doesn't wish your name to appear in the data set to be able to remove it. Uh, if you have these things, either would work. Um, and so from my experience, uh, you just have to make sure that there is uh, such a process in place, either through consenting, I repeat, when you obtain the data from the data subject, or through notices and balancing of um, the uh, data subject's rights when you obtain the data from a third source. I don't know if, if that has been clear. Thank you, Prodromos. Yeah. Um, I don't see um, any additional questions. Yeah, so let's call it a day. Thanks for staying on longer. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank so you. this was our first public webinar on, on policies that was outside the network. So we'd like to hold more and please write any feedback in the chat or fill in the evaluation forms that Gwen will send out. That's really important because we'd like to target this further to funders and institutions. So spread the word and let us know how we could tailor this content more to them. Mm -hmm. um, and any ideas for things we've missed out or... Um, Indicate specific good? topics that... Yeah, we hope it was yeah, useful and that you'll use the support material that Marina and her team have created. There's, there's one more question from Jonathan England. So if you have more questions about the topic, how can we ch keep chatting about it? Publicly, I mean, on the Slack channel or the internal, internally in open air, that's only internally. So we were thinking actually um, a year ago of creating a, a, a listserv on policy creation. Would that be useful, everybody? Jonathan, would that be something so that we can share with everybody who wants to be part of this list of examples of policies and updates. In general, if the community would find that useful, you could please write that in the chat because it was something we we had considered and open air would be the conduit to maintain that list about open science policies. Okay. Okay. So there is interest. Yeah. I don't know about a public Slack <laughs> <laughs> for the whole world. I mean, you're all welcome to join our open <laughs> Slack. But, um. Okay. So there's a poll. So maybe fill in the poll and let us know. A forum. Okay. So let's consider a forum or a mailing list so everyone can maybe choose something and then we have concrete feedback on how we'd... I'm glad you found this useful. Okay. Okay, so there's... A, yeah, fill in this um, poll that somebody set up and then we can have a feeling for what the attend attendees would like. Okay, let's think and about th the forum. I don't know if we have it as open air, but we can maybe talk No, there must it. be examples of community forums. And yeah. Yeah. If you have any concrete suggestions, that would be... Yeah, would be let us well. know. So. so on a very practical level, uh, uh, this webinar has been recorded. And uh, for those of you who've missed my announcement at the start, so you will all receive one more email from me together with the link to the recordings, which will be, uh, which will be a YouTube clip. Uh, the slides and an evaluation form. And we would really appreciate it if you would take some time to fill in the evaluation. It only takes like one minute and it's very useful for us. Yeah, it's essential <laughs> for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think that's, I think we call it an end then. Um, and yeah, keep in touch and con contact your NOAD if you haven't already, <laughs> if you're new to it now. 
And I'd like to thank everyone, Yai, for facilitating this and to all our really good speakers today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good day. Everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.